to make sound, you must move air. And really, that's what a speaker is doing. You can think of the vibration as you're pushing the air, just as my vocal cords are moving the air in a precise way in my throat that is being directed towards you, that your ear hears. So that's what we're trying to do. That's the whole goal. This is really where we need to get started. Just to tell you about what we're going to cover, it's speaker components, what actually goes into it, types of drivers, cone resonance, damping, compliance, impedance, efficiency and power, speaker response, dispersion, and speaker polarity. Some of the things towards the end are, and, and some of this you guys may know coming into this, this is a very broad, general, I want to give you a, a, a good range of topics, but near the end, you guys will, will know this, and I wanted to wrap up with that. Speaker components, I'll have a diagram on the next slide. You have the motor system, the magnet pull piece, front plate, the gap, and the voice coil. The diaphragm, which is the cone and dust cap, or sometimes there's a one-piece dome, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. And the suspension, which is the spider and the surround, and you can think of the frame of the speaker as part of the suspension, but it's not actually what's, it's what's holding the speaker, but not what you necessarily need. In a speaker, you know what the surround is, you've seen the diaphragm before, you've probably seen the little dust cap in, dust cap in the middle, uh, you haven't probably seen the voice coil or the spider, and I'm sure you've seen the back of the speaker, you've seen a magnet, and you've seen, this is also the, the back, bottom plate. All of these are working in tandem to get you sound. And it also provides some secondary functions, like the dust cap is really just there to protect this gap between your top plate and your voice coil. That's what the dust cap is for. Sometimes something that's not shown, especially on large woofers, is you'll have a vent hole to help with thermal issues as you're running current through that coil. In essence, what you're doing is you're pushing electric current through that voice coil, which creates a field around the coil. Most of you probably have 305, so you know that current through a wire, you're going to get an electromotive force or in a field around it. When you have that external magnet, the big magnet on the exterior, when those two fields interact, that's when you get the electromotive force. That's when you get the actual movement. Cone, which is connected to the voice coil, moves when the voice coil moves, so that's what you actually create pressure waves with, that's what you get the sound. We want as symmetric as a field as possible around that voice coil because you're putting a sinusoidal wave through, you need to have accurate reproduction of that sign that comes in with your motion. If you take the acoustics course, you'll get some techniques for how to take care of that. That's just speaker, that's what it is, those are the components. Again, you guys probably know any radiator speaker is called a driver. You have the woofer for the low frequencies. A woofer is anywhere from 40 hertz to 1 kilohertz. You've got the tweeter for high frequencies, anywhere from 2 kilohertz up to 20 kilohertz. We need to cover the whole band of human hearing. Woofers with limited frequency and piezoelectric tweeters allow for much limited crossover. Crossovers, you guys may know, it's just filtering your signal so you can send the frequencies you want to the specific feet. Speakers, we'll talk about that later and future acoustics course. But the big thing I want to point out is mid range, and you don't want to neglect the mid range. The ear is most sensitive to mid range sounds, or response, it responds most to mid range changes. It's very important that if you can include a mid range driver, to include a mid range driver. Sometimes, if, you're, if your uh, woofer is small enough, or what you're using as your, your low end is small enough, you won't need a mid range. but Generally, if you have a system that has a driver that's larger than 8 inches, sometimes you can get away if it's uh, with a 10 inch, but if you're larger than that, you're going to have a mid-range. A little bit of the physics. You can think of a speaker kind of like a mass on a spring. You have the natural resonant frequency of vibration. There is more movement as you approach a speaker's resonance. Every speaker has a resonance, and if we look at a curve, you'll see there's a peak, and then it goes up and end in the tail. But what I want to show you, and hopefully the cube will give it to me, is try to find the resonant frequency of the cube. 
And just as we're going here, I'll let you guys, as I get this going, I'll give you some jokes. So this is 50 hertz, and you can definitely hear it, but as we go up in frequency, there's 51 hertz. Can you hear it getting a little bit louder? Mm -hmm. It's 52 hertz, 53, and now it's getting quieter, right? So really, just with that, all that lead up to the short demonstration, <laughs> that I had is that you have a resonant frequency in every speaker system. And you may or may not be able to tell, but that's five hertz running right now if you were to put your hand on it. Be, be moving quite slowly. I can see it. <laughs> there you go. Going into another important topic is damping. Uh, it's all affected by the magnet size, the mass of the moving parts, and the internal resistance of the, the amp that you have hooked up to it. With damping and along with the electromotive force that I mentioned, any time that you have this electromotive force produced, always opposing the current that's driving the speaker, this is called back EMF. The bigger the magnetic field, the higher the back EMF, higher the electrical damping of the voice coil. The bigger the magnet, the more it's going to end up where it needs to be. Now magnet size usually does indicate speaker quality. It's the most expensive component. Manufacturers, if they're going to spend the money on it, you're going to know because you're going to pay for it. The big issue, though, is that if you get too large of a magnet, which can happen, but hopefully the speaker designer is doing their job, but if they, if they do overdo it, you can overdampen the speaker and you will reduce the bass response. Now, your degree of damping is measured by your response magnification Q, which is the tendency of the speaker to peak in response at its resonant frequency. As you heard, we were around 51, 52 hertz with that. So, Q, if you want to learn more, it's one of the most important things that you would need to know in building a speaker. The Q for that cube was set at 0.707. The size of the cube actually had to be built around the drivers that we bought, and that's why it's 6.23 cubic feet internally in the box. But we'll talk about that later if you want to learn more. Another important essence of a speaker is its compliance. It's the distance that the cone moves per unit of applied force. In a traditional suspension system, which you don't really see too much anymore, they're all kind of going to the high fidelity suspension, you'd see a single wrinkle. In the high fidelity, you see a rolled edge. You can see this is called an M roll right here shaped with the two peaks. Moving on, you have impedance. Very, very important. What's against that current flow in the speaker? With the impedance of a speaker, normally, let's say if you just hook up a multimeter to it, you'd actually measure about 75% of what its rated impedance is. For instance, most speakers are 8 ohm, but if you were to hook up the multimeter, you'd read 6. It varies with frequency, and that's that's the big thing. Let me show you a, uh, a response curve in just a minute so you'll be able to see what I mean. There are many home speakers that are 8 ohms. 8 ohm speakers are probably going to be the most common. Sometimes you'll find a 16, sometimes you'll find some random others. And if you have an auto speaker, it's probably 4 ohms. Does anyone have a Bose system in their car? My dad does. Well, Bose did something really interesting when they design the system and those in those vehicles they actually have like half home speakers and every speaker has its own amplifier there in the door impedance matching for for those of you who electrically you know this for for those of you not i'm not going to go into the details but impedance matching speakers with your amplifier is extremely important if you have an 8 ohm speaker make sure you connect it to the 8 ohm output on your amplifier some amplifiers will have a 4 ohm output if you put two 8 ohm speakers together, and you can connect it then to the 4 ohm output if you put them in parallel because you're effectively having resistance. How many of you live in apartments? Do you have the intercom system where someone can buzz and they can, you can, you know, talk to them? Right. Some of the newer systems actually include a microphone, but older systems, you would actually talk into the speaker, and on the other end, they would use a high gain amplifier. So speakers can be used 
They're just like Speak microphones. Speak with the dynamic microphones are the exact same mechanism. Exactly. I mean, they're, they're one and the same, depending on the use. Here's where we get into a lot more of the meat. You have the speaker response, you have transient response, and you have frequency response. With transient response, that's really its ability to handle a short pulse without distortion. You want to start moving the, the coil when you get the signal that says start moving the coil, and you want to end moving the coil when the signal ends. If you don't do that, you get what's called hangover, and that's oscillation after the end of the signal. That's what leads to your muddy sound in a lot of systems. A big part of this, uh, too, as, or as well, is cone resonance. It also adds to hangover. If you're at the resonant frequency, you're going to get some extra hangover, unfortunately. Every speaker, as we talked about, has at least one resonant frequency. However, there can be more. It's really, the fundamental is due to the cone, usually. So the lower magnetic damping leads to more peaking at your resonant frequency. Small cones bend at low frequencies, and large cones have good radiation resistance, but they have limited high range. That's the issue as you get bigger. There are some ways around this, and I didn't mention about the transient response, which is probably red. Poor transient response leads to hangover, and good transient response leads to the frequency which we're talking about. There are some ways around if you wanted to avoid a higher cost tweeter. Does anyone know what a whizzer is? Whizzer is a secondary smaller cone that's driven by the same voice coil and it's added to improve the radiation pattern and extend the frequency response. You get better bang for your buck, you've got two cones over the one coil. Or you could have a progressive suspension with newer technologies, polypropylene and, and other different plastic materials. You, as you're at a low frequency, the entire speaker can vibrate, and then as you go higher in frequency, it constricts to the center and only the center vibrates. So again, you get more bang for your buck. Traditional suspensions, the non-progressive, they're called linear, so it's just it's all or nothing. In the picture, it's just worth pointing out that it's a C's uh, woofer and C's tweeter, that this is an actual measurement. So it's a woofer and tweeter pair. It's not as if you were to just have one speaker which would have your peak and then it, it come back up like this. But you have both there, so you, you're trying to get that flat response. If the flatter the response, which again comes in with the cue, but that's a discussion for later, the flatter the response usually is what you're looking for. Dispersion. How many of you have ever been in front of directional speakers? You know what it sounds like? You walk past and all of a sudden it gets really loud, and then you go away and it gets quiet again. Sometimes you want to make directional speakers, but generally, you want your sound to cover the whole room. The sound waves are always more directional at the upper end of the speaker's frequency range. However, if you go too high, you're going to get a harsh sound in the path of the beam, and then you're going to get dull outside. It kind of sounds like a directional speaker, but it's not on purpose. It's because you push this driver past its frequency range. As a rule of thumb, omnidirectional are only up to the frequency where the effective cone diameter equals wavelength. For instance, a 12-inch driver is up to about 1.3K, 8-inch driver up to 2K, 4-inch driver up to 4 kilohertz, in general. Now, tweeters, if you look at a tweeter, you'll probably see that many have a dome on them. Dome tweeters are used to disperse the sound, and tweeters, why you want them usually, is they produce an airy quality, kind of like live music. That's why, you know, in a car, new car audio system, they're starting to go into, okay, we've got six speakers in a car, or we've got seven, or we've got eight, or we've got nine. You see a lot of up front. You see in the front of the doors or up in the corners of the dash, you'll see tweeters that are generally used for the high end. And actually, car audio systems are probably for a lot of people, especially you guys go into the work world, car audio system will probably, that when you buy your first new car, will probably be better than your home audio system unless you're an audio file and you've already built your, your own system, but they're getting better. And they're actually designed by a lot of really good people. Flarity, you guys, especially the electricals, will know this. You've got a positive and a negative. And if you put a mono speaker or a mono setup, there's no difference. And you can select either lead to either, either end. 
it doesn't matter. You're still going to move the comb. Now, stereo, you have an issue if you reverse the clarity of one driver. Let's say you have a, you, you mix it up. Now, your one cone's moving one way while the other's moving the other way. This tends to cancel out the bottom end. And especially, uh, have any of you done work in your car? Do you know, you know what a two-way or three-way system is? It's a speaker that has a two-way. It's your, generally your, your woofer or sometimes a kind of a mid-range with a tweeter in one. And then the three-way has all three in one unit. If you mix up the polarity, you will get gaps in your response curve. There will be frequencies where there's just holes. You don't hear anything. With that, I know this was very broad. Some of you might have known it. Some of this might have been new stuff. I just want to leave you. It's really cold out there. It, happy thoughts.